Discontented Media presents Dr. Bitcoin, the man who wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto, an original podcast series with Mark Hunter and Arthur Van Pelt. Hello and welcome to Dr. Bitcoin, the man who was not Satoshi Nakamoto, and part five in our Copa vs. Wright special series, something we did not expect to be saying days before the first bang of the gavel. The reason for this bonus episode is by virtue of events that took place on the same day last week, the forensic report into Wright's recently found evidence and his forthcoming settlement offer. And joining me to wade through the filings and the Times articles is what the finance's chief fake Toshi pioneer, Arthur Van Pelt. Arthur, this is an unexpected pleasure. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is, uh, Mark. <laughs> but thanks for having me again. A pleasure as always. Let's, uh, let's dive on in. Yep. We'll start on January 23rd, when a new filing dropped, one we've been waiting for since the first Madden report, the investigation into the new drives. It was joined in short order by three other reports, the first and second joint expert reports on Wright's evidence and another joint report on the LaTeX files. These reports covered Wright's new batch of evidence, recovered from the two drives supposedly found last September, which Justice Miller had agreed to let Wright introduce last month. These, remember, were the drives that contained the LaTeX files, which, Wright said, was the format that the Bitcoin white paper was originally written in, having never ever mentioned it before, as well as a host of other notes and scribblings to do with Bitcoin from the 2007 to the 2009 era. If the evidence was genuine, it would put Wright in a great position going into the trial. If it was yet more forgeries, however, it would not only bode ill for him at the trial, but potentially put him on a collision course with his new counsel, who had backed him to the hilt over his claims thus far. Arthur, we already knew a little bit about the LaTeX files from a December filing. Can you remind us of that, please? The first mention of the LaTeX files was uh, in those tweets from uh, Christian Agar Hansen in September last year, or early October, when he published an excerpt from his fairway brief, where we see Craig Wright searching the internet for answers over whether Satoshi ever used uh, LaTeX to write the Bitcoin white paper. Mm. So we kind of knew what was coming. And then, uh, yeah, uh, Craig uh, tells his counsel, which has now uh, uh, by now changed from uh, Travis Smith to Shoe Smith, if I say that rightly, yep. um, that he has these uh, amazing uh, latex files from 2007, around 2008. And uh, those files uh, are supposed to prove that he wrote the Bitcoin white paper originally in latex. But Copa quickly figured out uh, quite a few things based on that information that they were provided. For example, they were without uh, any doubt created after March 2022 and not around 2007 or 2008 because they found uh, latex components like um, pandoc that didn't exist in 2008 but as said uh, only after march 2022 and there are many many more issues which we will no doubt uh, go into uh, further in this uh, episode Mm -hmm. So, of course, Copa requested uh, to have access to the original material for further inquiry, and Justice Meller ordered exactly that just before Christmas. So, in the run of this month, January 2024, we will see what Copa made of uh, all these latex files and much more. Hmm. Copa's filing, subtly called Schedule of Dr. Wright's Further Forged Documents, began with a reminder that Wright had nominated the documents as the ones on which he plans to rely in his Satoshi claim that they were documents he had personally claimed to have looked for and discovered in September 2023, and that he had attached huge importance to them, calling them essential to a fair trial. They also reminded the judge that Wright only produced the files following Patrick Madden's first report, with some of the new evidence overwriting other evidence already found to be fraudulent, and that there was no chain of custody other than Craig Wright. He was going to live or die by this evidence. We won't go through all the forgeries, or we won't have time for all the other drama that's happened since episode 4, but we'll see what was discovered regarding Wright's crucial pieces. First, we'll tackle the LaTeX files, which were looked at by Spencer Lynch for Wright's team and Arthur Rosendahl for COPA. Both experts immediately debunked Wright's claim that he had created Bitcoin in LaTeX, agreeing that the original Bitcoin white paper was created in OpenOffice 2.4, and that, despite resembling the white paper, the PDF produced from Wright's main LaTeX file, main.txt, 
quote, is not the Bitcoin white paper and contains substantial discrepancies from it, including in its spacing, content as rendered, symbols in formulas and punctuation, unquote. Another key file Wright had identified, a LaTeX source file called ecache main.tex, was, quote, very similar to main.tex, but is entitled Electronic Cache Without a Trusted Third Party, unquote, which was the draft title for the Bitcoin white paper when Satoshi Nakamoto sent it to Adam Back and Wei Dai in August 2008. Coper also noted that the abstract of the paper matched the preview abstract in those Satoshi emails. Arthur, Coper combined the experts' findings with other evidence Wright submitted, and what did they find regarding these files? Well, these experts, they made a not-to-be-misunderstood statement, uh, Mark, and I will quote, The Bitcoin white paper was not written in LaTeX. It was written and produced in OpenOffice 2.4. It's metadata record that it was produced by that means. Examination by both parties' experts has led them both to conclude and agree that it was produced by that means based on every level of the PDF, from the fine details of its uh, typographical presentation down to the binary digits of the PDF. Now, furthermore, they state, uh, and I will quote again, Dr. Wright's selected LaTeX file does not, when compiled, produce the Bitcoin white paper, and neither does any other file in the TC folder. It compiles to a PDF which only superficially resembles the Bitcoin white paper, but which is in fact substantially different. Now, and they also note further, for the avoidance of doubt, the differences are not even explained by the belated indications given by Dr. Wright's solicitors on December the 29th of 2023, that there were certain reasons why Dr. Wright's file would not compile to a replica of the Bitcoin white paper, contrary to his previous statement on oath. Hmm. Now, yeah, so here uh, here we go again, Mark. We have Craig Wright uh, changing his story when the evidence uh, goes against him, mm-hmm. and even when it contradicts his own uh, testimony, and it still makes no difference. <laughs> yeah, and we have a little more, Mark, uh, this time uh, about uh, the Overleaf uh, account. Mm-hmm. And I will quote again, Dr. Wright's Overleaf account from which they were sourced was created on August the 8th of 2023. There is no previous record of the existence of these files. Now, and here is the killer mark. Dr. Wright had first created main.tex, that is one of the files, on uh, November the 19th, 2023 as a blank document. Dr. Wright had then edited the document main.tex over a course of at least 211 edits Whoa. in the period between November the 19th of 2023 and December the 1st of 2023. Wow. Dr. Wright had then engaged in over 150 further edits in the following days up to December the 12th of 2023. That's mad. Now, yeah, this is a clear case of uh, fraud upon the court, uh, Mark. Yeah, I mean, that's 211 and then a further 150. He's been a busy boy. Uh-huh. Crikey. What he tried with these latex files, he thought that uh, the metadata would not um, be so so clear to a mm. forensic expert. Uh, that yeah. was he uh, expecting and hoping and instead of uh, uh, less details, we get even more details in, in the debunks in, in the Madden reporting. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Well, talking of details, I'll stay with you for analysis of another LaTeX file, ng3.tex. And this was another belter, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, for sure. Um, Yeah, we cannot inspect these files uh, ourselves, of course, but from the description in the forensic report, we learned that, um, I'll uh, do a quote again, the ng3.txt is a LaTeX source document titled An In-Depth Analysis of of Proof-of-Work Calculations in the Hashcoin White Paper. That document presents as if it was a paper building on calculations in the Hashcoin White Paper or time chain white paper and purports to represent work on the Bitcoin system and or Bitcoin related concepts. Now, of course, this file was also recently created and then sloppily backdated and everything. But here is another killer mark. Listen, the okay. content of the deleted section 7.txt ends with the words, this section presents a set of recommendations based on the research findings targeting both 
practitioners and academic researchers. The citations are dot 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 dot. Now, that content is entirely consistent with an indicative of responses provided by an unconditioned chat GPT. <laughs> Here we go. Here to the is. question, <laughs> are you able to output some template latex code for section 7, which relates to recommendations, Super. including the structure length of response and the use of certainly and the use of the syntax uh, latex uh, to introduce the latex code. Now, this stuff is so amazing because chat GPT did not exist in 2007, of course. <laughs> it's so dry. It's so matter of fact. I love it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, yeah, so here you can really see that these people working for Copa, they are really going the extra mile in, in a very short time frame, uh, mind you, because uh, yeah, they, they did not have much time to research this, but still they managed to, uh, they must have been working day and night uh, in, in, in November, December uh, time frame, yeah. probably uh, day in January also, of course, mm -hmm. um, yeah, to get as much information on the table as, uh, as possible. And the thing is, he had all that time, he's had years to come up with these drafts for the Bitcoin white paper, knowing they were going to be needed in a lawsuit at some point, and they were still mm. awful. So bearing in mind, if he can't produce good copies and he's got years to do it, he was never going to get away with something having just weeks to put it together, was he? No, no. It, it, it is. He tried and failed. <laughs> Basically, yes. Copa then dealt with Wright's claim that it was impossible to reverse engineer the Bitcoin white paper into a LaTeX file and then a PDF, noting that both parties' experts agreed that this was not only not impossible, but is, in fact, quote, not difficult, unquote. In fact, Copa was able to identify the very software Wright might have used to do it, discovering that it produced, quote, nearly identical low-level coding, unquote. Rosendahl and Lynch summarised Wright's claims that the white paper couldn't be reverse engineered thus. Quote, On the subject of reverse engineering, the experts agree that it is not too difficult to reverse engineer the Bitcoin white paper to create a LaTeX source file that compiles to a PDF file similar to Dr. Wright's, which contain the same text, formulae and diagrams, and is superficially similar to the Bitcoin white paper. It would, However, be extremely difficult to use LaTeX to create a PDF which was an exact match to the Bitcoin white paper." Unquote. Coper also found that Wright used certain settings and features to compile the white paper that weren't available in LaTeX in 2009, meaning that, if compiled using the 2009 version, the PDF compilation process would produce a Bitcoin white paper as reimagined by Picasso. However, a Bitcoin white paper produced in OpenOffice 2.4, the one used by Satoshi and in use in 2008 and 2009, produced a perfect replica. As far as the eCash paper went, Copa found that, quote, the file cannot be compiled at all on a 2008-2009 version of LaTeX software, even with a concerted effort to make the file compatible, unquote. Maybe they just didn't try hard enough. Having dealt with the inauthenticity of the files, Coper then turned to Wright's reticence to hand them over in the first place. When Wright had been ordered by the court to describe the software environment required to compile the document, he gave a reply that was, according to Coper, quote, verbose and vague, unquote, with Coper adding that it believed Wright was trying to, quote, obscure relevant technical detail and supply irrelevant technical sounding information in its place and or to provide scope for Dr. Wright to give excuses for failures of his LaTeX files to compile into a true replica of the Bitcoin white paper, unquote. When it finally got access, Wright told Copa that no metadata existed in relation to the files hosted on the Overleaf account in question, something that, as we know, Copa found to be untrue, as it led them to find those 211 plus edits between the 19th of November and 1st of December last year. Copa also alleged that Wright, while refusing to provide the metadata associated with his Overleaf account, quote, sought to alter and embellish his story in respect to the number and type of accounts hosted on Overleaf and the supposed method of transmission of the LaTeX files, unquote. Arthur, Craig Wright even tried to stop Copa accessing the files once he begrudgingly gave them access, didn't he? Yeah, uh, this is again a doozy of an, of an anecdote, uh, Mark. <laughs> Listen, in respect of infodev09.zip, 
which is the name of the zip file, Dr. Wright has stated that infodev09.zip dates from 2009 and that he could not access the image. When asked for the password, Dr. Wright stated that he was hacked in 2020 and his password files were lost. Ah, the pineapple hack. Yes, <laughs> uh, that is implausible. When asked for details of the alleged hack, Dr. Wright stated that he had actually been hacked at least 10 times. <laughs> and then a cut and dry, that is at least 10 times more implausible. <laughs> <laughs> they can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Infodev09.zip contains a hash identical copy of infodev09.raw. It must therefore have been deleted after September the 17th of 2023, and it is to be inferred that the reason Dr. Wright withheld access to the password for infodev09.zip is that he knew the content of the file and that it contained the incriminating evidence of bdopc.raw being a recent creation, contrary to his story. So then he so he said he lost the passwords in the pineapple hack in 2020 but then he gave them access it's probably but the, but, referring to that yeah but then he found them so he didn't lose that data after all i don't understand what happened there if i understand it well uh, at some point he had to hand over the, the drives so they could uh, access the files and, and e either the forensic experts of copa they managed to crack the files and see the content uh, anyway because it's a zip file ah. uh, perhaps they have uh, tools to uh, to crack uh, and, and open up uh, zip mm. files anyway i did not see anything mentioned about it but it, it must have been something like that because if he did mm. not provide any password with a zip file then uh, uh, still, they found out several things about uh, that stuff. Uh, there were uh, deleted files that they managed to recover. Maybe they did not; the, those files did not have passwords. And a lot happened uh, in, in in this whole uh, uh, forensic inquiry. Mm -hmm. Copa also noted that the files were not disclosed in any of the twelve rounds of evidentiary disclosure that Wright went through, reminding the judge that he blamed Ontier for instructing him that they weren't valid. Ontier, however, told Copa's lawyers, presumably with a vengeful grin on their faces, that, quote, Dr. Wright's account is false in each and every particular, unquote. Where have we heard that before? Copa summarised the situation thus, quote, It is to be inferred that Dr. Wright's LaTeX files were not disclosed at that time because they did not exist at that time, unquote. Listeners to our previous episode will remember that it wasn't just Ontier that was thrown under the bus over the LaTeX files. Wright's former forensic examiners, Alex Partners, also joined them there, with Wright accusing them of failing to collect the BDO drive in 2019 for the Kleiman trial. Alex Partners allegedly did take the Samsung drive, but Wright says that they were unable to access the encrypted section because he didn't have the password to unlock it. When Copa tried to investigate Wright's claims with Alex Partners, Wright allegedly, quote, sought to frustrate those efforts, unquote, resisting both a request by Copa and a court order allowing them to speak to the forensics firm. Having finally spoken to Alex Partners, Copa called the story over the company's alleged failings unsubstantiated, but did not expand on their claims. So, Arthur, we can finally put the whole LaTeX thing to bed now, can't we? There is, and there never was, any indication or evidence to suggest that the Bitcoin white paper was written in anything other than open office, and certainly not LaTeX by Craig Wright. Yeah, amen to that, uh, Mark. But let's not forget, uh, to steal man the BSV camp, uh, camp a little, we are uh, convinced of this fact because we know the wheelings and dealings of uh, Craig Wright for many, many years. But let's not forget, the last hurdle to take, uh, of course, is the judge. Uh, he mm -hmm. still has to sign off on these uh, conclusions too. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. So let's say we believe Craig Wright's story for a second and the two drives had been sent to Dr. Edmund for analysis during the Kleiman versus Wright trial, as he apparently intended. Would that have had any impact on that trial, do you think? No, I don't think so, because I'm pretty sure that Dr. Edmund, the forensic expert uh, in the climate case, would have had uh, the exact same findings as uh, Patrick Madden, mm. which would probably have meant that uh, Craig Wright would have uh, quickly pulled uh, these hard drives from the climate case, like he did with a few other pieces of, uh, of evidence. Yeah, true. So finally on this then, and bearing in mind that these drives are something Wright seems to have just dreamed up at the last minute when he didn't actually have to do it, and then he managed to get the trial delayed over them, 
Just how much worse has he made things for himself by doing this? <laughs> yeah, in my opinion, and uh, my opinion I see being confirmed lately by a few lawyers who sometimes uh, interact with my uh, with my tweets online. I would like to summarize my opinion by a tweet that I posted uh, earlier this week. This, ladies and gentlemen, is fraud upon the court, creating forgeries during a lawsuit to try perverting the course of justice. In England and Wales, it is a common law offense carrying a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. Now, of course, this is not a done deal yet, uh, Mark, I know that. Mm -hmm. Justice Meller needs to rule that a fraud has been taking uh, place, fraud upon the court. And in the end, it's the Crown Prosecution Service, or CPS, who decides if the COPA case, and don't forget we should also add uh, the other UK cases uh, with uh, Craig Wright involved, is uh, worthy of uh, further criminal uh, fraud prosecution uh, of him. For me, it's the fact that he didn't need to do it. He expressly delayed the trial for all this new evidence and he's just made it so much worse for himself. He would have been better off if he hadn't done it. Yeah, 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 exactly. We now turn to the image of the BDO time capsule. Arthur, what was this and why was it so called? This time capsule thing, it, it, it's actually an image, as they call it, which is a sort of a backup of the whole content uh, of a computer, a PC or a laptop, and uh, that image file was created from a computer that Craig Wright supposedly used when he was working in Australia at a company called BDO in 2007. So the image file is named BDOPC.RAW. I think I mentioned that file before. Mm -hmm. We recognize BDO uh, in the name of uh, the file, which is the company where he was working. And we recognize, of course, uh, PC, which stands for personal computer. Um, yeah. For those who are less involved in IT uh, jargon, but, uh, I think everybody knows that. <laughs> so just to clarify something that somebody mentioned to me on, on Twitter or Reddit or something, the mention of BDO here is nothing to do with the company. The company BDO has no input or influence in this case whatsoever. The only reason it's called the BDO drive is because Craig Wright says that that's where he was working um, or maybe that's mm -hmm. the, that's it was a BDO related computer that the file came from, isn't it? That's the only connection we've got here. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. As we discussed in episode four, when COPA asked for an image of this drive to check for tampering, Wright imbued it with NSA level security clearance, attaching a list of conditions as long as a CVS receipt if COPA wanted to look at it. Justice Meller ruled, however, that standard pattern protection would suffice and told Wright to give COPA access. The reason why Wright had been so reticent was quickly established. Following COPA's initial finding that the drive had been manipulated between the 12th of September and the 19th of September 2023, further analysis revealed that in the days prior to the 20th of September 2023, substantial efforts were made to modify the contents of the drive and to do so, quote, in a way to hide when that activity was occurring and make it appear as if it had occurred in 2007, unquote. The BDO drive was analysed by Patrick Madden for COPA and, again, Stephen Lynch for Wright, with both experts coming to the following conclusion. Quote, The content of the BDO image as a whole is not authentic and it has been actively edited in the period 17th to the 19th of September 2023. The edits made to the BDO image are not consistent with automated software or background processes, but are consistent with editing by a user. Unquote. The experts also found consistent behaviour across both drives. Quote, the content of both the Samsung drive and the BDO image have been significantly manipulated and subjected to multiple clock and time stamp manipulation actions. It is not possible to determine the full extent of the manipulations from the available information. If a copy of the original 2007 BDO image, i.e. the copy prior to any manipulation, exists and it was made available for analysis, the experts could be more definitive regarding the extent of the manipulation to the BDO image." Unquote. Good luck getting hold of that. The experts also had something to say about Wright's claims over his use of certain software which made it look like files had been amended when they hadn't agreeing that neither drive images were linked to the SAN hardware Wright claimed to have used, while the BDO image lacked any indications of being set up for VMware or Citrix booting, as Wright had claimed. They also discovered references on the BDO drive to deleted items on the Samsung drive, and evidence of clock alterations associated with the manipulated documents. 
Wright had also claimed that the use of recovery software explained some of the date anomalies, but the experts dismissed this, and they also dismissed Wright's claim that the use of data copying tools such as Xcopy was the reason behind the manipulations and the backdating that the experts found. They also noted, and I'll quote, the information supplied in the witness statements of Dr. Wright does not change any of our conclusions. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Arthur, give us some numbers here. How many of the 97 documents did the experts think were fakes? Yeah, Patrick Madden, who is a corpus forensic expert, and Stephen Lynch, who is on the side of uh, Craig Wright, they stated together, we agree on the categorization of 71 of the 97 documents as manipulated. Now, please note, uh, Mark, this is not simply saying the docs are simply unreliable or not credible. This categorization means that someone has been willingly manipulating those documents. And we are talking about 73% of Craig Wright's reliance documents. Yeah, it's going to get worse, I can tell you that much. Yeah. Coper's story of how the BDO drive came to be was simple and, in hindsight, obvious. Quote, BDOPC.raw is a product of a process beginning with a computer that was last shut down on 5th of July 2007. A genuine image was captured of the content of the computer. That image, or a copy of it, was then subsequently edited in September 2023 to add, modify and delete files. This was done at a time when it was attached to another computer and without the operating system in use. The editing process resulted in BDOPC.raw. The manipulation of BDOPC.raw was done with the computer clock set to 31st of October 2007 so as to backdate the most obvious resulting digital artefacts." Unquote. Coper also found that in some cases, incriminating metadata relating to 2023 on the BDO drive was overwritten and replaced with metadata going back to 2007, with analysis revealing that a folder entitled My Files was modified on the 17th of September 2023 and backdated to October the 31st, 2007, the day Wright says the drive was put into its time capsule. Coper also found transaction logs on the BDO drive, which didn't exist on the version of Windows XP installed on the computer in question, but was introduced in a later version of Windows, such as the one used to edit the files, leading to another conclusion. Quote, Those transaction logs contain extensive records of editing of BDOPC.raw on the 17th of September 2023. Further, those transaction logs indicate other irregularities, such as files being backdated to appear as if created after they were last modified and accessed. So far, so bad. Patrick Madden also found multiple iterations of the BDO drive image on the Samsung drive and was able to recover two of them. Arthur, what did he find? Yeah, the images uh, that he found were 99.5% uh, identical in content to the BDOPC.raw image, with the remaining 0.5%, half percent, made up of, and then I quote, data pertaining to new Reliance documents and previous edits of new Reliance documents. These drive images are among hundreds of gigabytes of data deleted from the Samsung drive in September 2023. Further, there is a file still extant within the Samsung drive called infodev09.zip, which is encrypted and password protected. Infodev09.zip contains a hash identical copy of infodev09.raw. It must therefore have been deleted after September the 17th of 2023. Hmm. So just to clarify, uh, Mark, they found many almost identical images of the BDO drive on the Samsung drive, and the only bits that uh, didn't make it over to the BDO drive were previous edits of the evidence that he submitted. <laughs> so the two drives are yeah, sort of brothers, we can say. Okay, and Arthur, I'll stay with you for the Pandoc document, which I remember you liked when you came across it last time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I certainly did. <laughs> uh, on that hard drive with uh, LaTeX files, they also found files that were showing traces of uh, a LaTeX software tool called Pandoc, as it was described in the, in the filing. These documents have been created with the Pandoc document conversion software. Pandoc is an open source piece of software that can convert documents between different formats. It can generate uh, LaTeX documents automatically. In particular, one document contains a line which states that it was created as LaTeX via Pandoc, which is characteristic of the use of Pandoc. 
Now, yeah, and the thing with this Pandoc software, only in March 2022, it was released by Mr. McFarlane is his name. And uh, he is going to testify for COPA, we, uh, we know now. Hmm. So that immediately dates Craig's latex forgeries to a period after March 2022. But <laughs> yeah, I didn't stop here, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, when they looked into the details, the dating of the forgery could even be fine-tuned uh, a bit more. And I quote again, inspection of the source code of Pandoc allows for more precise dating. The document was created after October 2022. The version of Pandoc used for creation of this document uses code that was not committed to Pandoc until October 2022. Hmm. Now, yeah, and then Patrick Madden, the forensic expert, follows up with a uh, subtle October 2022 is after the commencement of these proceedings. Now, yeah. To emphasize uh, that we are talking about fraud upon the court uh, again here. Well, I, I think October 2022 is being generous to Craig Wright, isn't it? <laughs> we know it's a lot later than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. By now we know that it was even more closer to uh, today. A year after. Uh, instead of, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but we'll get to that, uh, no doubt. Yes, definitely. Wright also loaded the BDO drive with alleged precursor Bitcoin white paper works, one of which contained internal timestamps using a version of Microsoft Word that wouldn't be released for three months, and several of which used a rich text file editor released in May 2020, files that were then backdated to the 31st of October 2007. Many of the recovered files were also present in the images recovered from the Samsung drive, but had crucial differences, such as the author's name having been changed from Lynn Wright to Craig Wright, internal timestamps and Grammarly timestamps dating them to September 2023, and the use of software and fonts that weren't available in 2007. Copa also found Dragon Dictate files that appeared to be earlier iterations of the final drafts of many documents with September 2023 creation dates, suggesting that Wright had been dictating the contents before polishing up a final draft and trying, but failing, to delete the dictation files. Wright's 2008 LLM proposal was undone by Grammarly timestamps from 2019, while the other experts Copa consulted also gave more detail on certain elements, including Wright's C++ source code for Bitcoin, which was dated to 2011 due to its use of libraries that didn't exist until then. The reports also showed Wright trying to enter digitised handwritten and hand-drawn evidence, which fared almost as badly. One of these, a handwritten piece called hash-based shadowing, had been presented as an image file, with metadata analysis showing that it was scanned using a model of scanner not available until 2015, seven years after Wright said the drive was sealed up, with COPA making a wry point on the scanner itself. Quote, The Xerox Document 5540 scanner is Dr. Wright's current scanner. It is the same scanner used by Dr. Wright on the 11th of December 2023 to scan his own seventh witness statement served in these proceedings. These reports were followed a couple of days later by a statement from COPA which summarised the experts' findings and their own and contained an important note. Quote, COPA has introduced new forensic evidence that definitively proves the inauthenticity of several documents that Craig Wright considers crucial to his claim that he is the founder of Bitcoin. This was not only the conclusion of the expert COPA retained to forensically examine Wright's documents, but the conclusion of the expert Wright retained as well, unquote. So again, just in case some of you out there didn't hear that properly, both COPA's and Craig Wright's experts concluded that multiple documents Wright supplied were forgeries, and he swears that no one touched them other than him. Okay? You getting it now? Arthur, now we've got these new reports and more detail in terms of dates, can you help us piece together a timeline of what COPA alleges were Wright's actions from the time of the first Madden report? Uh, yeah, the first Madden report uh, dropped on September the 1st of 2023. Craig Wright knew on that day that his Satoshi evidence was quite thoroughly uh, debunked as COPA found no less than 431 forgeries. They were uh, summarized in a report of almost one thousand pages crazy <laughs> yeah but all that material was made worthless in uh, one massive blow and craig no doubt realized that he could not survive a trial uh, with that material anymore uh, so he immediately started to create uh, new forgeries that he hoped would work as replacements of the old debunked uh, material he shared several of those forgeries already around september the 5th with Kristen ager hansen at that moment still the ceo of enchain 
And yeah, this will go bite him in the, <laughs> you know where I mean, uh, in the future. But we'll get to that. Because what happens next is that Craig is claiming that he found two hard drives from the 2007-2009 era with new Satoshi information. And he shares this information with his council. And this council informs COPA's council. And then after some back and forth about what this new info is all about. Now guess when Craig claims uh, that he found these drives with new information around September the 15th. And guess what was among this new information? The documents that Craig Wright shared with Agar Hansen 10 days earlier. <laughs> so to cut a long story short, Craig provided metadata information in October 2023. And from that information alone, COPA's forensic expert uh, Patrick Madden figured out that Craig Wright had been fooling around with the drives and the files on it. Um, in and around uh, September 2023. Yeah, I mean, that timeline just fits so perfectly with the reports, doesn't it? Yep. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. Yep, yep, certainly. Copa summarised that Wright must have tampered with the files on at least eight occasions across three days in September last year, and, as the experts had attested, dismissed his claim that the software on the drives was the reason for any odd behaviour Copa might find. The first thing we of course need to ask at this point is, how did Wright think he was going to get away with it? The answer to this can be found in his actions once Copa requested the drive, or at the very least the image, and the access to Wright's overleaf account. As Greg Maxwell, now a defendant in this case, noted on Reddit, Wright fought tooth and nail to prevent Copa from having access to the raw images, somehow thinking that the judge would rule that Copa didn't need to see them and that they would be happy with the files alone, which he still resisted handing over. And when he was forced to hand them over, he still tried to prevent Copa getting access. Arthur, for years, we've had to put up with Craig Wright celebrating the fact that he can finally get his best evidence into court. And yet when he finally gets the chance to do so, he refuses to hand over access and only complies, begrudgingly, when the court orders him to. That's hardly a ringing endorsement of it, is it? <laughs> yeah, I say that again. <laughs> and by now we know why that was. <laughs> Oh, yes, we certainly do. We certainly do. <laughs> yeah. The second joint report, this time between Patrick Madden and Wright's first expert, Dr. Plax, focused on 23 documents not covered in Dr. Plax's first report. Patrick Madden believed that all 23 files were manipulated, with Dr. Plax believing that all but five were, with those five being unreliable rather than manipulated, and none being authentic. They... Two, dismissed Wright's arguments over the way some of the documents appeared, accusing Wright of misinterpreting how Microsoft Word and data recovery tools work. So, Arthur, there's lots to dig into here, but to recap, we have four experts from both sides looking at 120 pieces of evidence, which Wright says date from the 2007 to 2009 period. Wright's own expert says that 26 of these can't be included in analysis because of a lack of information, so we'll leave those out. This leaves us with 94 pieces of evidence analysed, of which both experts agree 87 were manipulated from at least September 2023. That's a hit rate of over 92% definite forgeries. And don't forget that those 8% are unreliable rather than authentic. Yeah, these numbers are certainly mind-boggling, uh, Mark. There is so much to say about this. Think about it. This is supposed to be the case of his lifetime where he is supposed to prove once and for all that he is no doubt left the inventor of Bitcoin. And after a failed round of over 400 forgeries, we should be expecting the best of the best of the best. Right? Hmm. But no. They recovered deleted files with unfinished forgeries on a fake drive between them. And these files contained numerous fingerprints on how Craig Wright created these forgeries that he later filed in court. I mean, come on, the guy is supposed to be a wiping discs expert, <laughs> mind you. So if anything, this shit, and please allow me to call it shit, <laughs> this shit backs up the fraudulent nature of the previous bunch of forgeries that Craig Wright uh, created. So how did the BSV community take the news that there were now three joint reports eviscerating Wright's bombshell evidence? CoinGeek didn't mention it, obviously, while its proprietor, Calvin Eyre, said that the report was fiction before adding that the evidence didn't matter anyway and added that the documents were, quote, not for sure forged, just altered, and ones that will not determine the case, unquote. So, there we go. Not forged, just altered. By Craig Wright. A few weeks ago. Then, inevitably, 
the conspiracy theory started, with suggestions that the reports weren't genuine because they were only available from the Bitcoin Defence Fund's website, like all the other documents are, while others questioned the handling of the evidence itself. Quote, The truth is, none of the documents the opposition is holding are even the real ones. Craig holds the original and just a copy are the thing that these people are holding. Who knows what they even did to those? Remember that these files from the opposition will still be compared with the original files Craig is holding. They will still be asked how they come up with their result and compare it along with the original. The judge will be the only one who will decide and none of these trolls can tell to us which are fraud and which are not." This, in case you're struggling to understand the logic here, suggests that Craig Wright will be allowed to whip out some unsubmitted and untested evidence during the trial. The judge will rule that he's Satoshi immediately, whereupon Wright will be hoisted up onto his lawyer's shoulders and carried out of the courtroom to cheers and confetti raining down from the balcony. We got an idea of what this untested evidence might be on Friday, when Craig Wright began posting quotes from Satoshi Nakamoto to his Slack group, and then to Twitter, that he claimed no one had ever seen before, including the following. Quote, Bitcoin is a distributed secure timestamp server for transactions. A few lines of code could create a transaction with an extra hash in it of anything that needs to be timestamped. I should add a command to timestamp a file that way. Unquote. Where had this quote originated? Wright didn't say, but he was very confident of its provenance, telling one of his sycophants that the quotes would be, quote, public soon and verified, unquote. What Wright didn't seem to know, however, was that the quote itself was already public and verified. It is part of an email sent from Satoshi Nakamoto to Hal Finney on the 4th of March 2009, and is readily available for anyone to see from the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute website. Honestly, he's got an entire institute named after him, and he doesn't even bother to consult it. Outside of Fantasyland, and over on the BSV Reddit page, visitors were urged to just ignore the findings and read Zeeming Gao's latest masterpiece about proving negatives instead, while this was the rebuttal from one well-known BSV acolyte on YouTube. I mean, look, the thing is, you can only commoditize data one way, and that's the way which was set out in the white paper, and that way is only followed by the protocol that now is the ticker symbol BSV. Because SegWit protocol segregated the signatures, that's fraud. It put the one megabyte block cap in place, that caused limitations and restrictions, meaning it can't be a commodity. But I mean, it's fraud, they've broken the chain of signatures, they can't go back. Uh, They completely control the chain now. They're tampering with digital signatures. So they are, I mean, again, I can't believe that nobody's putting forward the economic argument here. Um, Does my head in actually. Yeah, I can't imagine why these highly paid lawyers haven't thought to put forward an argument that has nothing whatsoever to do with the case. Most of those responding to the news with a BSV bent were seemingly unaware that these were joint reports, and any that happened to bring up the troubling findings were shouted down by others who said that they were meaningless findings because it was either Copa lies or it had no relevance until the judge looked at it, which we'll come to in a second. At this point, it's worth remembering just how excited Calvin Eyre was about the chance to put Wright's best evidence in front of a judge. On the day the suit was filed in April 2021, Eyre tweeted, quote, Blockstream submits to jurisdiction through COPA in Craig's hometown and gives Craig the benefit of evidence as a defendant and lets Craig get all his evidence in so many ways in front of a judge in the best way he could have dreamed of, unquote. Nearly three years later, that evidence is less important. Quote, There are so many witnesses in Australia, that is why this case will not turn on documents that even Craig says cannot be trusted as we cannot establish provenance for them. The documents thing will be blown out of the water as mostly not relevant by the judge. This is about tech and witnesses." Pivot! Pivot! Arthur, to this argument that the evidence analysis is just one part of an entire case that hasn't been heard yet, I get that, and it's true, but these people seem to be ignoring the fact that court cases are predicated on evidence. Physical evidence will trump witness testimony every single time, and with very good reason. So it baffles me that these people, and there are more than one, are expecting the judge to just, I don't know, ignore the fraudulent physical evidence and somehow be won over by witness testimony from like 17 years ago, and Craig Wright's ideas. I mean, I have to assume they're just deflecting at this point. Yeah, of course they are, uh, Mark. Somehow these people that think that uh, when the fraudulent evidence uh, disappears out of sight, that it doesn't exist anymore, 
or it is not important anymore, as if nothing uh, happened. Mm. But this burying your head in the sand uh, attitude uh, doesn't help. And we noticed that already in the McCormick lawsuit, uh, as you no doubt uh, remember. Mm. Craig's false evidence uh, that he pulled uh, just before trial in that case uh, blew up in his face uh, anyway, and he lost uh, the McCormick uh, uh, liberal lawsuit. And the same will, yeah, very likely. I mean, there's no doubt in my head that uh, that's going to happen with the, with the Copa case uh, again. Also, this idea that the judge is going to be impressed by the BSV tech with regards to Wright's Satoshi claim, something I think many people fail to grasp is that you don't have to have invented something to make a different or better version of it. Like, Boeing didn't invent the aeroplane, but their planes are better than the one the Wright brothers came up with because they learned about it and turned it into something else. The judge is just, he's not going to give two shits about BSV, is he? No, it appears so indeed. Craig Wright tried to bring in a sort of expert witness called Zeming Gao, who had written a comparison between uh, uh, Bitcoin, BTC of course, uh, and uh, altcoin, or affinity fraud I call it mostly, <laughs> uh, BSV. Uh, and Justice Meller simply didn't allow uh, Gao as a witness, so there won't be much uh, discussion about uh, tech, I'm afraid, Mark. And there is... I think, half a day dedicated to the difference between Bitcoin and BSV, where experts on both sides will uh, will testify, mm. but the judge will only be interested uh, in uh, this as it pertains to the identity of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, mm. and he will not be interested in uh, the block size of uh, TerraNote, uh, I can tell you. <laughs> oh no, I wouldn't have thought so. Thankfully for the BSV community, something else came along to sweep all talk of forged evidence under the carpet, Craig Wright's settlement offer. Now, Arthur and I had planned to do a deep dive into this between us, but the fates have conspired against us to make this impossible before the trial, so you're going to have to put up with me going through it solo before we go back to Arthur for what happened next. The settlement offer arrived just hours after COPA released its findings over the new batch of forgeries, and it was a stonker. Wright began by claiming that at the COPA vs Wright trial, he intended to, quote, uphold my intellectual property rights in Bitcoin as its creator, unquote, and added that, quote, the focus of my various litigations to date has never been on revealing my pseudonymous identity as Satoshi Nakamoto, unquote. One cannot reveal what one doesn't have. Wright said that the core of his offer was to, quote, agree to waive my database rights and copyrights relating to BTC, BCH and ABC databases, and to offer an irrevocable license in perpetuity to my opposing parties, unquote, which makes the Russia-sized assumption that Copa believes that Wright is in a position to waive anything more than a white handkerchief. Wright asked that Copa's claim against him be dropped, with him dropping his other UK court cases in return, and with each side, astonishingly, paying its own costs. He then asked that both sides send the value of their costs, which he put at £1 million, to a charity instead. Very easy to do when it's not your money in the first place. Wright agreed to not push any legal copyright claims against developers of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin ABC in return for protection from any rights in relation to the BSV database, as if anybody would want to admit to being the real owner of that piece of hot trash, and agree that all chains could live and exist in their own right under the recognition that, quote, Satoshi Nakamoto's original vision of Bitcoin was for small, casual transactions and scaling on-chain, unquote, and that, quote, BTC, BCH and ABC now have separate purposes and uses not contemplated by Satoshi Nakamoto, unquote. This, of course, is Wright's most recent pivot after the world's best at big data line never really took off in 2020. Another clause said that COPA and its members should, quote, undertake to ensure that bitcoins shall be used for the benefit of humankind broadly and not to launder funds, evade tax, or assist in any other illicit behaviours, unquote, and that they would, quote, where required and possible, actively seek to create code to ensure compliance, unquote, with regional regulations. As we know, Wright is very proud of BSV's Hand of God, which can seize the funds of anyone it doesn't like, as long as they can throw a document of comparable force to a court order under Tal's nose. Or, you know, if someone in the upper echelons doesn't like you. Wright also asked that COPA's members, quote, be prevented from exploiting any BTC, BCH, ABC or BSV database to create, copy, fork or otherwise a new Bitcoin database, unquote, and use, quote, best endeavours to ensure that no third party carries out the aforesaid, unquote, which is a simply impossible ask and left with a parting shot that, 
quote, any entities shall cease claiming that they represent the original Bitcoin as envisioned by me as Satoshi Nakamoto. Additionally, they must publicly acknowledge that the intended purpose for creating Bitcoin was to create a system to provide micropayments, to allow for the chronologically ordered validation of transactions, and to facilitate scalability, unquote. This, of course, totally undermines the entire purpose of the lawsuit, which is asking the judge to rule that Wright is not Satoshi Nakamoto. Finally, Copa was asked to, quote, cease any media campaigns against me, unquote, which, unless you count the mildly critical segments of its tweets, there is no evidence that it's doing this whatsoever. Unless, of course, we're talking about the social media assassins that we all know MasterCard usually funds. At this point, anyone with an ounce of understanding of this trial should be thinking, what has all this talk of benefits to humankind and charity donations got to do with the trial? This is a very sensible question to ask. The answer to which, of course, is nothing, and it was never intended to. In fact, in agreeing to the settlement, Copa would be admitting that Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto and would allow him to litigate on that basis, the exact opposite of what Copa is asking for. The language has been chosen specifically to make Wright look like a magnanimous inventor just hoping everyone can find a way to get along, as opposed to his actual desire to crush the exchanges and the developers involved in this litigation to extinction. In fact, the comparison between Wright's stated aims on social media and his stated aims in the settlement show two entirely different people, illustrating the disingenuous nature of the offer even more. Make no mistake, this settlement isn't Wright reaching halfway, it only tangentially addresses the three claims initially made by Copa, and even then it asks them to basically admit defeat on all three right before the trial when it has proof that Wright forged most, if not all, of his evidence. Wright called these terms broadly uncontroversial and beneficial to the industry as a whole, which they certainly weren't, and at first everyone seemed taken aback. Even Kurt Vuckert Jr. confessed that the offer, quote, feels like retreat, unquote, but that was before the propaganda bandwagon swung round the corner with its lights blazing and klaxon sounding. Arthur, I'm 100% certain that, like us, almost all BSV supporters had no idea what to make of the offer, but Calvin Ayer soon gave them the line which has been parroted ever since. A COPA rejection would be taken as proof that it wasn't all about open patents at all, and it just wants to dominate the space at the cost of free enterprise. This makes more sense than this being a knee-jerk reaction to the revelations over the new evidence, doesn't it? It's a bit hard to say because these things uh, followed each other up uh, so fast that I uh, had a second thought uh, for a moment. These settlement offers take time to uh, prepare, so it might have been prepared earlier than uh, than we think. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's just a thought uh, I had. Yeah. We can't be sure about it. But this offer was never in a million years uh, genuine. The only purpose was uh, to try and make COPA look like it didn't stand for the open patent system it advocates and to try and paint Craig in a good light for making a fair offer where both can coexist harmoniously together. Now, of course, this is uh, absolute rubbish as Craig uh, has no intention of uh, doing that and COPA is holding all the cards now. Mm. So Craig is like the mouse who has been caught by the cat and he is trying to make the cat look like the bad guy. Hmm. Of course, we can't forget uh, the number of times that Craig has promised uh, to crush his legal opponents and leave them homeless. And the first time he faces uh, someone his own size, he resorts to these tactics. And uh, if you ask me, it's uh, rather shameful, uh, really. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. Wright gave Coper seven days to respond, but they took less than seven hours, rejecting the offer in a tweet. Quote, Hard pass on that settlement. Just like Craig Wright forges documents and doesn't quite tell the truth, his description of the settlement offer isn't quite accurate either. It comes with loopholes that would allow him to sue people all over again. It would also force us to accept that he is Satoshi." Unquote. A week or so later, Wright's team took the odd decision to take out a half-page advert in The Times where they proceeded to publish the statement offer in full with no context. Arthur, I can only think that this was another attempt in their PR war to get neutrals on their side, but people are just going to be baffled by reading through a legal filing in a newspaper with no idea what the case is even about. I mean, that is even if they get to the end, which I doubt they will. 
most people are just going to read the first few lines of this, think, oh, this isn't aimed at me, and move on, aren't they? Yeah, sure thing. I mean, <laughs> on it's the. Uh, yeah, it, it's a bizarre thing to do. I mean, the only uh, reference that I could make is that it was in the Times, which is the same uh, newspaper where the real Satoshi took a headline to put in, in the Genesis block, as you might remember. Mm-hmm. And for the rest, I have no idea what, what is the, yeah, the background of putting this. Uh, and it was an advertisement. Eh? It, it, uh, top top yeah. left if i remember it says the word it's an ad it's a paid uh, advertorial yeah in the times why why no idea no idea it's weird yeah just weird yeah Wright's camp naturally gobbled down the rejection and the advert rubbing their hands with glee at the trap that copa had idiotically fallen into by rejecting their offer with more claims that Wright was playing 5d chess in forcing copa to admit that by rejecting the deal it didn't stand for open patents at all one well-known BSV supporter claimed that Copa's rejection would be, quote, used as evidence against them, unquote, which I really, really hope it is, but only those of a BSV persuasion were taken in by the ruse, with plenty of pushback online. Calvin Eyre spammed Twitter again, including a lengthy tweet which is worth exploring in full to ascertain his mindset at this point. Quote, I am still shocked that an organisation with so many companies from so many industries, many of them competitors, and with a stated reason for existing to be freeing software and enabling fair, lawful competition, would be able to publicly reject Satoshi's offer to do exactly this, publicly, in just a few hours. If this looks weird to me, it's going to look even weirder to the judge of the upcoming trial. Let's not forget, Craig is the defendant in this. This trial would not exist if Copa did not think Craig was Satoshi and COPA has done nothing since it was formed other than sue Satoshi. No consortium of this size comes together and does nothing but sue one UK scientist if that person is really a fraud. This only happens if this person is a massive threat to their established interests. COPA only exists to kill Dr Wright's ideas and technology. This lie about why they exist has now been publicly exposed. I believe COPA has been hurt with this move, both in the eyes of the court and in the eyes of the public. We do not have to wait long to see what the judge says. I expect COPA lawyers frantically reviewing all their pleadings today. Unquote. Arthur, none of us is quite sure if Calvin Eyre is still sniffing what he's selling anymore, but a few points here. First, he says he's shocked that COPA rejected the offer, which he obviously isn't because it was designed to be rejected. He's just trying to play some weird sympathy card here. But I get the feeling he genuinely thinks that this will look bad in the judge's eyes, but if you were the judge, what would your reaction be to this deal being tabled? Yeah, oh, well, that's an easy one for me, uh, Mark. I firmly believed after uh, reading Craig's uh, settlement offer that Kepa would fully reject uh, Craig Wright's offer uh, to settle because the settlement was not offering anything that Copa wants in their uh, lawsuit. Copa basically wants uh, a ruling with uh, three uh, elements. Uh, one of those elements is Craig is not Satoshi. The other element is Craig has no Bitcoin copyright, and that will make the other cases that are halted uh, fall apart. And uh, of course, uh, the recently added pleadings that should lead to a ruling like uh, Craig is a fraud Mm -hmm. or dishonest or serial forger or what I summarize that uh, Craig is a fraud. And um, yeah, not any of these uh, three bullets were offered by uh, Craig Wright in his uh, settlement offer. So yeah, being the judge for a minute, I would uh, totally understand this. Just to be sure, I would maybe even ask a question or two or three uh, during the trial about this uh, settlement event. Mm -hmm. Next, he's suggesting that COPA was set up to sue Craig Wright, when in fact it was set up three months before Wright even sent out those cease and desist letters. So that's bollocks. And then he says that they're only suing him because they know he's Satoshi. This is some Olympic level mental gymnastics here. If you plan to sue Hulk Hogan, for example, you won't sue the actual Hulk Hogan because he'll be able to prove pretty quickly in court that he is who he says he is with some fairly robust evidence, I'd imagine. But if your next door neighbour claims to be Hulk Hogan and you want to sue him, then you can be pretty sure that his evidence is going to be so bad that you're pretty much guaranteed to win. So it in fact makes no sense to sue someone if you think they are the real thing. Am I going mad here? (laughs) No, no, Mark, you're not. Good. Uh, (laughs) Go for that. Yeah, indeed, it it, it would make no sense uh, to sue the real Satoshi because you won't win. But if you're threatened with legal harassment by a fake Satoshi, 
who you know will only be able to produce fraudulent evidence, then, yeah, why not? Yeah, that's the person you sue. <laughs> yeah. After this, Calvin claims again that Cooper was set up just to sue Craig Wright, and then says that in rejecting the offer, they're lying about why they exist, which we've already touched on. He also says that Coper only exists to kill Craig Wright and his ideas, which plays into the conspiracy theory that Coper wants Craig's patents, which reminded me of a line from that email from Calvin to Craig that was leaked by Christian Iger Hansen, in which Calvin says, quote, This of course will mean that you lose all other cases, other than maybe the token theft case, but to me, losing Coper even puts this at risk, as Coper will set precedent that you are not Satoshi in law. All IP, other than N-chain patents, will disappear. So here, Calvin explicitly says that the patents won't be touched because they're end chains, not Craig Wright's. This just proves it's all spin, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. And you have no idea how many times, it must run into the dozens uh, by now, I think, uh, how many times I have been explaining uh, this on Twitter to uh, fans and followers of uh, Craig Wright. Not any patent, no patents are part of the COPA lawsuit. The word patent is not even mentioned once in the particulars of uh, claim of COPA. And yet we still get this story that this is all about patents, because when they were set up, they were talking about protecting members from nuisance patent litigation, among other things. Mm. And that's exactly what they are doing. And I still don't see how a judge ruling that Craig Wright isn't Satoshi means that Enchain has to give up its patents. It totally makes no sense, Mark. No, no, it's baffling. As for Copa being hurt by the move and frantically reviewing their pleadings, if there's one law firm frantically reviewing its pleadings, it's Shoesmiths. Let's make that very clear. I know we've said this before, but it just struck me again while I was researching this episode. Calvin Eyre is being forced to firefight on a regular basis, replying to random people on Twitter to protest his case. I counted something like 20 instances in one or two days where he just finds random critics, replies with the same thing, and then jumps onto the next one. What does he think he's achieving with this? I have... No idea, Mark. <laughs> I just cannot grasp that this guy who is supposed to be a billionaire, still, I wonder sometimes, but um, I can only presume that he is still a billionaire. But anyway, he, he is running several companies within the BSV uh, realm, but also outside, uh, that he can spend half a day or more tweeting to his followers and random strangers on the internet. Those people have no influence whatsoever, but he is so desperate that he will just appeal to everybody and anybody uh, rather than looking for the kind of institutional adoption that uh, BSV needs to keep it alive. True. We also heard from Zeming Gao on the offer, and he had this to say about the lawsuit. Quote, Its real purpose is to thoroughly discredit Dr. Wright, kill BSV and render Enchain's IP less effective. They looked at Enchain's patent portfolio and decided it was necessary to do something about it, hence the lawsuit. On the surface, the lawsuit is about the Satoshi identity and white paper copyright, but the true target is the BSV blockchain and N-Chain's patents, unquote. Now, I can't pretend to know what Copa's aims are. Maybe they are trying to crush N-Chain and BSV. I don't really care either way, to be honest. But there's a key point here that needs to be said. N-Chain and BSV shouldn't be in the slightest bit concerned if Craig is Satoshi. If he is Satoshi, then the lawsuit isn't just a formality, it's something that they should be welcoming because the value of their patents shoots up when it's confirmed. So if Craig is Satoshi, by this point he would have had two forensic reports, and possibly more from the other side, backing up the watertight evidence he put forward to back up his claim, and he would be just cruising through this. That's what he promised, and that's what Enchain and BSV would have been expecting. And we would see Calvin, Craig, Stephen Matthews and the rest of them throwing out quotes from the reports that show the documents were created in 2007-2008. And we might even see Copa asking to settle on terms that would allow them to keep developing patents or whatever they do. So that's where Enchain and Calvin Air expect to be by this point. Instead, we have about six reports, I think, including joint reports from both sides that are so damaging that people genuinely think they can't possibly be real, and Craig Wright having to make a ludicrous settlement offer which his team can use to switch the narrative away from the atrocious evidence. And instead of toasting the evidence, which he's been saying for years is going to smash Copa, you get the BSV leadership doing the online equivalent of yelling through people's letterboxes for people to not believe what's in front of their eyes. Compare that to Copa, which has put out three tweets on the case 
One to say it filed the claim in April 2021, one more over a motion it won eight months later, and another the other week rejecting the offer. They have had no need to deflect anything because all the analysis has gone in their favour, and they certainly don't need to make any offers when all the evidence is on their side. So if Enchain goes down in flames because Craig Wright can't back up his claims, what does that say about Enchain's strength as a company? They're admitting that the whole thing can collapse based on a court case related to one executive who doesn't even work there anymore. Yeah, that's a weird flex uh, if you ask me, Mark. <laughs> if Copa is after Enchain patents, then they need to go after Enchain directly and leave Craig Wright alone and actually make sure that he is declared Satoshi as that would make the patents uh, 10 or 100 times more valuable. Hmm. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is something to say uh, for the suggestion that when Craig is not declared Satoshi, that the value of Enchain patents will drop further. Of course, Enchain will not be happy uh, with that. So this is uh, Calvin's dilemma in pushing this narrative. He is indeed uh, publicly admitting that Enchain patents are at risk because of a lawsuit over the cosplaying antics of a guy that doesn't even work there anymore. And lots of people work for Enchain, so this is livelihoods we're talking about. But seeing as they maintain that Craig is Satoshi, there is uh, nothing to fear, <laughs> right? Mm, oh yeah, <laughs> everything's going swimmingly. <laughs> so looking at what Craig's options are then, if he goes into the trial using forged evidence that he has sworn is genuine, and which Calvin Air now says he knows isn't, then he could be in serious legal trouble as well as potentially losing the case. So the question then is, could he pull the evidence which would avoid this outcome and would also weaken Copa's case because it has no physical evidence to debunk? Now, our Reddit legal scholar Prime Patterns gave a great insight into this and he said that if Wright did pull his evidence, it would, quote, likely fatally undermine his claim to be Satoshi Nakamoto because the only remaining evidence would be the human sources who failed so miserably to convince the Oslo court, unquote. So it might be to his benefit to pull the evidence and rely on witnesses, however bad they are, because they can't be worse than the physical evidence he's put forward. On the other hand, while he might think it lessens his chance of defeat, it might not make a difference to the fraud allegations because, um, I'm going to quote Prime Patterns again here, quote, the evidence of fraud and fabrication is principally Coper's expert testimony, which is based on his analysis of documents submitted by CSW, which is Craig Wright. The withdrawal of the documents does not change the significance of Coper's expert analysis of them, unquote. So in summary... While pulling the evidence might help him at trial a little bit, it is irrelevant to the court's assessment of whether the evidence was fabricated. Now, we're just a few days out from trial and Craig has not pulled any more evidence. What are your thoughts on this, Arthur? Yeah, that's a good question, because I also expected that uh, Shoesmith, that they already would have pulled uh, the plug on Craig right also, but that didn't happen uh, yet either. We saw what he did with uh, Peter McCormack, and we still have a few days to go. And we are recording now on a Wednesday, which uh, with only two working days to go before trial uh, starts. So maybe there will be a few surprises in the next uh, two working days. Who knows? But it wouldn't surprise me if he pulls the evidence uh, at the last minute again. Mm -hmm. The other thing to think about is how he could argue against this evidence in court, assuming he takes it all the way. Now, he could argue, as he has done in the past, and in this case a little bit, about his systems being hacked and all the rest of it, although he's never provided any evidence of that. And for some of it, he can argue that the chain of custody means he can't be held responsible, as Calvin Ayer is hinted at. But I just don't see how he can wriggle out of the LaTeX files and the BDO drive and the Samsung drive. He has been very clear that they originated from him and no one else has touched them and they are forged. I just can't think of a defence for this, can you? Yeah, nay, I tried, but, <laughs> but no. Only when he decides to throw his ex-wife Lynn or his current wife uh, Ramona or perhaps the cleaning lady uh, under the <laughs> bus for uh, ruining his work, <laughs> yeah, then he might have a uh, lame excuse uh, again. Yeah, but it, it's hard to imagine that Craig will come up with uh, such an excuse, but you never know. Uh, I, I think he's going to surprise us. I think he has to defend the evidence. He's going to find some crackpot excuse. It's going to yeah. be, be a beauty, I think. Yeah. Well, whatever happens, we can expect fireworks, um, especially with Craig Wright on the stand for six days. So just to recap the crucial dates, 
Craig Wright will be on the stand from February 6th to the 12th or the 13th, which will be followed by Calvin Ayres case winning witnesses and Coper's hopeless dementia ridden dunces. We're planning to cover the trial through two podcasts, one around the 17th of February looking back at Craig Wright's testimony and another around March the 6th covering the witnesses and all the rest of it that's happened since then. But you can keep up to date with the daily goings on through the various live reporters who will be doing their best to keep us up to date and who we will be using for much of our material. And talking of witnesses, we hear on the grapevine that Stephen Matthews will be testifying for Craig after all, hopefully with a more rigorous cross-examination than we've seen to date, and who knows, maybe with some evidence this time, or not. (laughs) Arthur, I think that's everything. It's taken about three years to get here, but I finally have great pleasure in saying I will see you on the other side of Craig's testimony. (laughs) <laughs> yes sir <laughs> yeah and yeah i'm happy and proud to have been with you for this long and at times intense journey mark yeah it's been a lot of work but hopefully the reward's going to be worth it so i shall speak to you soon yes sir cheers thank you for listening to this episode of dr bitcoin the man who wasn't satoshi nakamoto Don't forget to subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice to get these episodes the moment they drop. And if you enjoyed what you heard, we'd really appreciate a star rating and even a review to help us get this out to as many people as possible. Our monthly bonus episodes are available to download from our website for a small consideration. And if you'd like to access all these bonus episodes, plus these monthly updates a few days early and other goodies, you can do so by becoming a Dr. Bitcoin supporter See the details in the show notes for information on how to do this or head to our website, drbitcoinpod.com. That's drbitcoinpod.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at drbitcoinpod and you can email us at drbitcoinpod at gmail.com. That's drbitcoinpod at gmail.com. Thanks very much for listening and we'll speak to you again soon. You've been listening to Dr. Bitcoin. The Man Who Wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto. Written by Mark Hunter, with additional material by Arthur Van Pelt. Editing and production by Mark Hunter. This has been a Contented Media Production.